Welcome to Short Story Theater, Season 2, Episode 3. This is your host Basil Nightingale with a tale about life and death. Not in general, but in the particular life and death of one Mr. Carlo Santanelli, who is about to meet his maker. Now for the people here in the little theater, in the alley just off Main Street, and for all those seated in their podcasts all over the world, here is a happy little story we call, Chris Kringle, Attorney for the Defense. And now, here is your narrator, Matthew, La Book. After suffering severe breathing difficulties, Carlo Santanelli was taken from his room at the Senior Living Center to Cape Cod Hospital. The 74-year-old man, unconscious when admitted, was placed in 327, a room with an excellent view of the busy Hyannis Harbor. When he awakened, Carlo found himself embedded in a well-padded 1940s-style easy chair. He looked around and saw several similar chairs, and a number of tables with magazines stacked in neat piles. This looks like a doctor's waiting room, he said to himself. The notion was soon confirmed by a sign on the wall that read, Make yourself comfortable, someone will be with you shortly. This is your waiting room. Feel free to use the fridge or anything else you want. Carlo saw the refrigerator on the wall opposite his chair. He walked to it and opened the door. There were quarts of milk in glass bottles. Real see-through glass, just like when he was a kid. The milkman used to place two of them on his mom's doorstep every morning before dawn. There's a thick layer of cream on the top of the milk. That's exactly the way it used to come in the old days, each cord would have two or three inches of cream on top. My mom scooped the cream off so she and dad could have it in their coffee. The delicious aroma of percolated coffee perfumed the room. Seeking the source of the nostalgic smell, Carlo saw a stainless steel pot of fresh coffee on a hot plate. Small white cups and saucers were nearby. Carlo filled a cup with a steaming brew and scooped some cream from the top of the milk bottle. A set of shelves next to the refrigerator was stuffed with his favorite breakfast cereals. One had bright yellow boxes of Cheerios. Another contained post-dosties and a third was laden with a whole row of northern grits. It was a cereal called Cream of Wheat, in warm red boxes featuring a picture of a jovial African-American chef. Then he spotted his favorite cereal of all, long since gone from the shelves of American supermarkets, full-size Nabisco shredded wheat in long, tall rectangular boxes. The biscuits, as big as kitchen sponges, were put in the box in layers and each layer was supported by a thin trading card. The cards featured tips on survival, or facts and photos of ships, planes and cars. To a 1950s kid, the Nabisco trading cards were like gold. Then Carla saw something else even more valuable than shredded wheat. He had not seen them in almost 70 years. There was a whole case. An entire case of. The original Twinkies. The real deal. Not those nudie ones that everybody else seems to love nowadays. The Twinkies of the 1940s and 50s had a thick slab of chocolate frosting on top, with a squiggle of white cream, just like Hostess cupcakes. Real Twinkies were his number one treat. When they stripped away the chocolate and the squiggle and sold them as naked sponge cakes, Carlo stopped eating Twinkies. Carlo happily downed four genuine Twinkies with his coffee. His thoughts of reaching for a fifth ended with the opening of a door. A short, bearded man walked into the room. Hello Mr. Santonelli. I am sorry you have had to wait for me. I've got a heavy schedule today. But I do hope you are enjoying the waiting room. We made it especially for you. And also I want to thank you for picking me for your counsel. I know you. The white beard. The voice. It's you, Chris Kringle. And Chris, you look exactly the same as you did about a hundred years ago. In that movie, it was called, Miracle on 34th Street. Shaking his head in disbelief, Carlo blinked his eyes furiously a few times. But the image did not go away. First real Twinkies, and now, the real Kris Kringle was standing right in front of him. I am actually not Kris Kringle you know. My name is, Edmund Gwen. Ah, but I played Kris Kringle in the film you mentioned. 
rather well too I suspect since I won the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor in 1948. But never mind that now. Thanks again for selecting me as your counsel. Counsel for what? I don't get it Chris, I mean, Mr. Gwen. Well, for your trial of course. You have to go on trial. Surely you realize that. Don't you? What trial? Why am I going on trial? I haven't done anything wrong. Mr. Santinelli, we all have done something wrong at one time or another. This is your final reckoning and I will represent you when you appear before the high power. You're talking nonsense. I don't get it. Ah, I get it now. I don't think you remember dying. I didn't did I. I remember having a little trouble breathing, that's all. I was just in the hospital for a while. I am sorry, Mr. Santonelli. I thought you had been filled in. Yes. You were in the Cape Cod Hospital. You passed away there last night. The cause of your demise was COPD. Breathing difficulties. Okay. I'm dead. I guess I can live with that. But, now I have to go on trial. To see whether I go to heaven or hell? Is that the deal? That pretty much sums it up. Well Chris, or should I say, Mr. Gwen. In the movie, you got everybody to believe in Santa. So, I guess I'm in pretty good hands. But, I didn't select you. Ah, uh, but you did Mr. Santonelli. Sit down and I will explain. Carlos slid into the easy chair. He wasn't sure. But he thought it might be like the one his mama had when he was in elementary school. Close to about seven decades ago, back in Yarmouth on Cape Cod. Mr. Santinelli, are you listening? Oh yes, sorry Mr. Gwen. This chair that I'm sitting in? It. It, seems so familiar that I was lost in a daydream for a minute. Don't worry about that. Now, if I may suggest. Why don't you refer to me as Chris? That's who you remember me as. By the way, you did pick me. You see, everyone who comes here after they leave Earth, gets to pick their own advocate for the judgment. And you chose me because... Miracle on 34th Street, that was my favorite movie. I loved it. It had a happy ending. You were proven to be sane, and the real Santa and it never changed. All my life, I had to deal with change. I'd get a pretty good job, and then the economy would go bad, and I would get laid off, and have to start all over again. On television, my favorite shows would be cancelled, only to be replaced by unwatchable nonsense. But every Christmas season, your movie would come on, and calm me down, and bring me back to Macy's, and the Christmas parade. I loved it. Yes you did Mr. Santonelli. And that's why you picked me for your advocate. I'll speak for you when you go before the high power at your trial. Why do I have to have a trial? Everybody does. Even Mother Teresa. When somebody dies, they come here for a reckoning. Your whole life is put under a microscope, and then a judgment is made, on where to place you. There are an unlimited number of worlds you can go to. Some of them are heaven, beyond your wildest imaginings, and others are. Well let's just say that they are not so nice. But don't worry, I will be with you as your counsel, during the judgment. Wait a minute Chris, you keep saying I picked you. I don't remember anything about that. No you wouldn't. It's all automatic. Based on a person's subconscious preferences a choice is made for them. You can change lawyers if you wish. A lot of people pick Elvis, but not so much anymore. John Lennon is a popular choice. Abe Lincoln is a good selection. He was a pretty fair lawyer. Some people even pick President Richard Nixon. Dick is pretty tricky, you know. You can have anyone you want. Chris. I wanna stick with you. Well I think that is just fine Mr. Santonelli. Just relax here for a while. I will be back shortly.
Have some real Twinkies and some more coffee. I have taken a quick look at your file, and it doesn't look too bad. Well, I know for sure, that I was no saint. I did a lot of things, I wouldn't want my mama to know about. Really, what are my chances? Honestly, I don't know. There certainly are some smudges on your record. But I see a lot of good things too. If I were a betting man, I would say that the worst you will get is an okay world, one where you will spend eternity, not in punishment, but not in luxury either. Thanks Chris. One more thing, is there really a hell? I am not supposed to answer that. Let's just say that, there is a hell. But it is not a place that a person is sent to. And it is not a place created by the high power. It is a place of a person's own devising. Up here, a man or a woman, has an unending chance to ponder their life. Regrets, past crimes and bad deeds, can be as torturing to some people, as actually being cast into a everlasting, burning pit. Ah, let's stop talking about such things. Have a few more of your chocolate covered Twinkies. I will be back before you know it, and we will start preparing your defense. As the recently deceased, 74-year-old Carlos Antonelli sits in the waiting room, drinking coffee with cream skin from the top of a bottle of milk, seeming to come from the year 1949, while eating original, delicious, chocolate-covered Twinkies. His counsel, Chris Kringle, is making the long walk to the celestial courtroom. After a few moments, two stern-looking, large men, dressed in black pinstriped suits, came into the waiting room. The black fedoras, with white hat bands on the top of their heads bobbed in unison, as they spoke simultaneously, telling Carlo to follow them. He did so, in complete silence. They led him to the celestial court, and escorted him to a chair. Carlo was frightened, but less so when he realized, the heavenly courtroom, looked just like the one in Miracle on 34th Street. Just a few seconds later, Carlo was joined by Chris at the table in front of the judicial bench. He began to suspect, that he was involved in some sort of a massive prank, or a candid camera set up. At any moment he expected John Payne, Maureen O'Hara, and Natalie Wood to walk in. The stars of the movie did not walk in. But Shellhammer did. Shellhammer, in reality an actor named Philip Donge, was the pompous head of Macy's toy department, who caused so much trouble for Chris. Shellhammer was announced by the bailiff, as the chief of prosecution. He walked to a seat at a table to the left of Chris and Carlo. Before him was a stack of papers a foot high, containing reports of every bad thing that Carlo had ever done. By comparison, the pile of papers Chris assembled, listing the good things, was very small. We eat. We eat. We eat. We eat. We eat. We eat. Quiet in the courtroom. Quiet in the court. Silence. Silence. Here, Here comes, comes the judge. judge. Here comes the judge. The inimitable. High the power. inimitable. The inimitable. High power. High power. All rise. All rise. All rise. The high power seemed to float, not walk, towards his seat at the bench. He had a face. At least Carlo thought he had a face, but it could not really be seen. It was more like a lit-up light bulb, than a face, and it hurt Carlo's eyes to look at it, for more than a second or two. There is no, jury, here, intoned the high power in a voice that came from his light bulb face, but was so loud and powerful that it caused the tables and chairs to vibrate. I am the jury. I am the judge. I alone decide where people will go. I will listen to all the evidence, and make a decision. I already know the facts, and the outcome. I know what the prosecution will claim, and how the defense will respond. I know the evidence, that will be presented. These proceedings are not conducted for me, but for the person facing judgment, so that each individual, will see and remember, every detail of the life, that he or she lived. The high power stopped speaking. The light of its face dimmed, 
and for a moment, Carlo could see a human face. It was a familiar face, but he could not place it. The high power looked directly at him, and said in a much softer, gentler voice. Carly. Dear Carly. Carly. Do you understand? Nobody but his mother and father, ever called him Carly. Any ideas he had of this being a cosmic joke, were cast aside. Carlo knew that he really was, facing the final judgment. The high power's face began to glow like a light bulb again. Prosecution, begin, it said. Shellhammer cleared his throat, snatched a pile of papers and began a litany of every one of Carlo's transgressions from age three onwards. Your Honor, when he was ten years old, he skulked into the A&P supermarket in South Dennis on Cape Cod, and made his way to the cereal aisle. There were 3D, Google Eye stickers, affixed to the outsides of Cheerios boxes. The defendant willfully peeled off and brazenly stole, exactly, four stickers. I object. Let the record show, that little Carlo, deeply regretted his actions as soon as he left the store. His sorrow was such, that he went to confession, admitted his crime, said his prayers, and then walked back to the store, and reattached each and every one, of the four stickers. Objection sustained. Objection sustained, ruled the high power in a voice that sounded like the roar of an airplane engine. And so it went. For hour after hour Shellhammer droned on with recitations of Carlos every misdeed. Most were minor, but as the proceedings wore on, the sheer volume of them made Carlo feel that he was in trouble. Finally Shellhammer fired his last shot, and then it was Chris Kringle's turn. Your Honor. Carlo Santanelli was not an especially good man. And he was not an especially bad man. He was like most men. In life, he usually wanted to do the right thing. But like many people, he sometimes wandered away from the main road. But not so far so that he couldn't quickly get back. Chris ticked off a few of the good things that Carlo had done but was interrupted by the high power, who said. Before you speak further, I want Mr. Santinelli to know, that what you are about to say, is either the knot in the noose, that will hang him, or the key, that will unlock the door to his freedom. In other words, that which you are going to refer to now, is the tipping point of this judgment. It will be the deciding factor. You may proceed. Thank you your honor. Earlier, Mr. Shellhammer told you a story of three bad boys, one of whom is my client, who abducted a young girl. I want to set the record straight. My client, was in the car that day. My esteemed colleague, told you that the young woman, was abducted. He did not tell you what happened to her. I have created a video reenactment of the alleged crime. I will put it on screen, so we all can watch it. Chris Kringle went to the left of the high powers bench, and opened up an old-fashioned telescoping, movie screen. Walking briskly he returned to the defense table where an ancient movie projector had been set up. He called for the courtroom lights to be turned off and flipped the switch to start up the projector. Captions on the bottom of the screen set the date as June 1960. The movie showed a beat-up 1949 Ford parked on Bell's Neck Lane. A dirt road in the backwoods of Cape Cod, near a small, sandy-bottomed kettle pond. It was close to four in the afternoon, and three young men about 17 years old, were outside of the car drinking beer from glass bottles. They had skipped out of school early that day, to go cruising. Along the way they picked up a girl, who was hitching a ride on the Mid-Cape Highway, Route 6. The girl, a year or two younger than the boys, was shown sitting in the back seat of the 49 Ford. Tears stained her face and she was shaking, like a washing machine with an unbalanced load. She knew what was going to happen to her. Hey Big Savu, we're almost out of beer. Don't we have any more? Yeah Chooch. We still got some more beer, at the campsite. But I think we should have some fun, with this girl before we go get some more beer. The teenager called Sabu, leered at the sobbing girl and turned up the collar of his dungaree shirt. Turned up collars, were the latest fad, on Cape Cod. Dozens of boys had been kicked out of school for wearing their collars turned up. But not, the big Sabu. 
school officials kept their distance from young Mr. Sean Sabuto. Called Sabu, by everyone, including the teachers. He was the only boy in school, who was allowed to wear dungarees, and motorcycle boots, to class. He always had a few pals with him, who treated him like a rock and roll king. Chooch, was one of his main followers. Chooch, was a star football player, who had the IQ, of a donut. He was infamous for showing up at school dances, wearing a suit, but instead of shoes, he had, basketball sneakers on his feet. In the 2020s that's probably not only acceptable, but even fashionable. In the 1960s it was a fashion faux pas second only to showing up at the dance naked. Carlo, the third boy, was just out for the ride. He was flattered when Sabu asked him if he wanted to join them. He was excited when they picked up the young female hitchhiker, because it was said that girls who thumbed rides would pay for the ride, with sex. At 17, Carlo longed to have sex. He thought he was probably the last virgin, in his entire school. Janie Swanson used to pull up her dress in class, and show him, that she was not wearing underwear. She had made a date to meet him one Saturday afternoon on the hill, behind the school. He waited until dark, but she never showed. Carlo was eager to participate in the action with the hitchhiking girl. Until he saw her fear when Chooch got in the back with her, and started to try to take off her blouse. She wept and said she only wanted a ride. She was not looking for beer, cigarettes, or sex. Chooch, ripped her blouse, and fondled her. She became loud and hysterical. Sabu decided to drive to a place deeper in the woods to make sure nobody would hear her screams. By now, Carlo wanted no part of it. He lacked the courage to tell them to let her go. He wasn't sure what would happen if they started with her. Would he go along out of fear? Hey Sabu, we really need some more beer before we take care of her. Okay Chooch. We got some more over at the campsite. Let's go get it. Carlo you stay here, and watch the broad while we get the beer. Don't let her out of the car. The big Sabu, followed closely by Chooch, walked off towards a tent site, where they had a cooler full of beer. It was the best. Rhode Island Zone. Narragansett. In the GIQ size, giant imperial quartz. When they were out of sight, Carlo's eyes locked on the girls. Carlo. Please. I have to go to the bathroom. Okay. You can get out. Are you going to let me go by myself? I'm going to let you go home. Get out of here quickly before they come back. Get out and run. Don't stop until you get home. Thank you. I knew you were not like them. So your honor this boy? This frail boy who weighed barely 130 pounds? Was taken into the inner circle of a ruthless, savage thug, yet a thug who was immensely popular, and had throngs of female admirers. So this boy, who was small and not powerful, this youngster, who had hardly ever kissed a girl, was longing for his first sexual experience, but this youth, my client, would not allow the imposition of a horrible rape crime, against the young woman. In the end, despite whatever else he may have done, he did remain true to your number one command. He kept the golden rule. given you the keys to anywhere and everywhere you may tear all the heavenly worlds and live wherever you wish case dismissed you are free to go And so the high power in his wisdom, gave Carlo Santanelli the keys, to everywhere, and anywhere. He said that Carlo could visit all the heavenly worlds, and then spend eternity in luxury, happiness, and endless joy. 
Ah, my friends, a happy ending to our play. This is Basil Nightingale speaking. It was my pleasure to portray Chris Kringle, who in the film Miracle on 34th Street, was played by the noted actor Edmund Gwen, who did indeed win the 1948 Academy Award for his splendid performance. Our narrator was Matthew Larbook. And as always, the author of the story, and producer of short story theater, is Bill Russo, who also directed the presentation. Thanks for listening. And please, come back again soon. Won't you?